Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to our Lord's house. We're going to begin tonight by watching the Wells Connection. Hi, I'm Wells President Mark Schrader. Starting a new church from scratch is no easy feat. There's certainly a lot of planning and preparation that goes into it. But with that can come great blessings for those given the opportunity to serve our Lord in this way, no matter how old or young they may be. Up in the north woods of Wisconsin, in the village of Cronenwetter, is a group of Wells members working to start a church from the ground up. It's free. free. It's free. No, no, no. If you would just fill out a fill survey. Out a survey. Out. That would be great. This church has just recently been approved for mission status from the Board for Home Missions. They're so new that they don't even have a pastor yet. It feels difficult because we're used to going to a church and having a pastor lead us through those things or going to a Bible study and having a pastor or a leader take us through those where we've had to take that on ourselves. But I think it's definitely been a growth experience for many of us. The core group is made up of Wells members from area churches, some of whom are students at the local area Lutheran High School, which just so happens to be located right here in the target area of Cronenwetter. The ability of the Northland Association just to say, hey, we have this space and we want you to use it is pretty phenomenal. At least in the short term, worship services will be held right at the high school at no cost to this new church. We'd just like to ask you a few questions uh, as a little survey for our new church. In addition to that, Northland students have been involved by canvassing the community and surveying their neighbors about their interests in a new church. At Northland, we're really focused on teaching our students how to learn to grow in their own faith and, in, and to share that with others. And then not just in our school community, but to go out into the community and share God's love with everybody. One of the neat things, right, is that especially teenagers, they're they're incredibly gifted and incredibly useful for ministry. Oftentimes, teenagers will think in ways that adults won't necessarily go. And so how neat is it that we have this ministry that will sort of be shared, where we have a workforce that can go out there that can help the Mission Church. Our topic for today is Jesus is coming soon. Not only can involving the youth be beneficial for starting this new mission church, it can also have a tremendous impact on their own Christian lives as well. It's really nice because sometimes it feels like at church, like it's like an adult thing and the kids are kind of just there, but like this year, like they wanted our consideration and they wanted our ideas. By inviting the students in on the conversation, it has allowed them to have a sense of ownership. That church isn't just something that they go to, but that they are the church. I think we'll especially see the fruit down the road as they graduate and, and go on to college and then wherever they work and, and raise their families and when they're members of, of churches in our synod, I, I gotta believe they'll be very involved and will have grown from their experience with the mission here in Cronenwetter. Just watch them grow in their faith and to learn at such a, a young age how important it is to share with others who need to hear the hope of Jesus, to need to hear the message of joy that we have. I can't explain to you, especially as a mom, how important that is to me to see my own kids just being so willing and open to share their own faith all the time. As this core group continues to connect with the community, the next step will be to call a pastor and eventually launch public worship here at the high school trying to start a mission that's totally focused on the lost, the lonely, and the hurting from a ground level uh, has been, um, I think, uh, energizing for a lot of us, and uh, we're very enthusiastic about it. This new mission congregation is in the first set of mission starts and enhancements to be included in our Synod's new 100 Missions in 10 Years effort. At wells110.net, you can follow the effort's progression and support it with your prayers, involvement, and gifts. Amen. 
In our current series in worship, we're listening to stories that Jesus tells us, and tonight we hear him tell us a story about devotion, the devotion that God has towards his people. We're going to continue with our first hymn, hymn 570. God's blessings on your worship tonight. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins, and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father 
and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, in your bountiful goodness, keep us safe from every evil of body and soul. Make us ready with cheerful hearts to do whatever pleases you. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Isaiah 5. I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. Now you dwellers in Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, 
Why did it yield only bad? Now I will tell you what I am going to do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge, and it will be destroyed. I will break down its wall, and it will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland, neither pruned nor cultivated, and briars and thorns will grow there. I will command the clouds not to rain on it. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the nation of Israel, and the people of Judah are the vines he delighted in. And he looked for justice, but saw bloodshed, for righteousness, but heard cries of distress. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Philippians 3. Not that I have already obtained all this, or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us then who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already obtained. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters, and just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For, as I have often told you before, and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. The word of the Lord. Thanks. Please stand. The Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 21. Jesus said, Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. The tenants seized his servants. They beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. Then he sent other servants to them, more than the first time, and the tenants treated them the same way. Last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? He will bring those wretches to a wretched end, they replied. And he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his, shop of the, his share of the crop at harvest time. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. Please be seated for our next hymn.
Let's work our way back through Jesus' story for us tonight. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. The landowner is God, and the vineyard is his people. And you can see right away the devotion that God has towards his people as he carefully gets everything set up in that vineyard. God had specially called and chosen his people. He had rescued them from slavery in the land of Egypt, and then he got them carefully settled, planted in the promised land. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. God entrusted his people to the care of priests and elders and other religious leaders. It was their job to look after the spiritual needs of the people. But those priests and elders and other religious leaders often did not do that. Often they just served themselves. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. The tenants seized his servants. They beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. Then he sent other servants to them, more than the first time. And the tenants treated them the same way. God sent prophets to his people. But many of the people did not want to listen to what the prophets had to say. Many of the religious leaders especially did not want to listen to what God's prophets had to say. So they mistreated them. Some of them they even killed. Last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. God sent his son to his people, Israel. But many of the people did not want to listen to him either. Especially the religious leaders did not want to listen to him either. And so Jesus was taken outside the city and killed. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? He will bring those wretches to a wretched end, they replied, and he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. What was God going to do about those religious leaders, those people he had entrusted his vineyard to, his people to, who only turned around and didn't take care of the people and mistreated the prophets and then killed his son? Well, of course he wasn't going to let them get away with that. He was going to punish them. He was going to take his people out from under their care and he was going to have his people prosper elsewhere under different management. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. Jesus is the stone that the builders rejected. The religious leaders rejected Jesus. They didn't want him. They, they cast him aside and had him killed. But God raised Jesus from the dead and made him the cornerstone, the rock on which God's building rests, the rock on which God's people are built. And if many of those Jewish people were not going to believe in Jesus and be built onto him, then God was going to build other people onto Jesus by faith. Non-Jewish people, Gentiles. This story that Jesus told is about how many of the Jewish people, including especially their leaders, rejected the Savior that God sent to them. Now, there certainly were a number of Jewish people who did believe in Jesus, just like still today, there's a number of Jewish people who believe in Jesus. But many of them rejected him, and so they were cut off from God's people. But God still has his people. He's always going to have his people. God has built many Gentiles onto Jesus by faith. He's made us to be his people. So besides giving us the super basic overview of Bible history, what does a story like this have to tell us today? By our time, there's really nothing surprising about the idea that many Jewish people have rejected Jesus and been cut off from God's people, right? This has been going on for 2,000 years. 
And also by our time, there really isn't anything all that surprising about the idea that God has brought many Gentiles to believe in Jesus and built them on to God's people. That's been happening in large numbers for 2,000 years as well. So what does a story like this have to teach us today? Well, Jesus told this story as a way of giving a warning to his fellow Jews and to especially their leaders that by rejecting him, they were being cut off from God's people and God's people were going to be other people, people from somewhere else. And that's a warning that we, as God's people today, need to hear as well. When God's people reject the Savior that God sends them, they are cut off from God's people. And God's people are going to be different people, people from somewhere else. You see, God has promised us that the church will never cease to exist. God will always have his church until the end of time, until Jesus comes back for it. But God has never promised us that the church will always continue in our country or in our city or in our building. We can't control what other people are going to do, can we? But this is a call for us to be continually refocusing ourselves on Christ, the cornerstone that we are built on. And it's a call for us to be doing what we can to build other people onto Christ, the cornerstone, building them up with God's word. And that would include people who already know Jesus and those who don't know him yet. What else does a story like this have to show us? It shows us how devoted God is in all of this. You saw the devotion of that landowner to his vineyard, didn't you? He carefully got everything set up. He sent a series of servants to it to collect its fruit. And even after the farmers that he had rented that vineyard to mistreated those servants, even killed some of them, what did he do? He sent his son. Doesn't really seem like that's a very logical thing to do after how those, those tenant farmers had treated his servants, right? But that's how devoted this landowner was to his vineyard and to having the fruit of his vineyard. See how devoted God is to his people, including to you carefully planting you in the faith, sending you those who would speak his word to you, and most importantly, sending you his son. God sent his son Jesus for you, not even just in spite of the fact that he would be killed. God sent his son Jesus for you in order for him to be killed for you, to save you from sin, to make you his own, so that you would be the fruit of his vineyard. That's how devoted God is to you and to having you as his own. In our first reading before, we heard another time where God told kind of a similar story about a vineyard. And in that one, we could hear God's heart breaking, couldn't we? As he thought about all of the people, his people, who had rejected him. He said, what more could have been done for my vineyard than what I have done for it? An exasperated sigh like that shows us God's heart, his heart for his people, how the thought of not having them pains him. <laughs> That's how devoted God is to you. The love God has for you is the kind of love that is literally willing to do whatever it takes to save you, to have you, to keep you, to bless you. God did whatever it took in sending his son for you. God will do what it takes to keep you for himself. It's with this kind of devotion that God builds you and all of his church on the risen Christ the cornerstone. Amen. Please stand.
we confess our Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Almighty God and Father, we thank you for all your mercies, especially for the gift of your Son, through whom you have revealed your gracious will. We praise you for the Holy Spirit and his working through the means of grace. Strengthen and defend your church, that by your word and sacraments, faith may grow and love toward all may increase. Support all who spread the light of your truth throughout the world. Keep our children in the grace of their baptisms. Enable their parents to train them in lives of faith. Preserve our nation in justice and honor. Guide and bless all who make, administer, and judge our laws. Give them wisdom that they may promote justice and hinder evil. Let your blessing rest on planting and harvest, commerce and industry, medicine and science, the arts and culture. Protect all who travel and care for those whose work is difficult or dangerous. Comfort all who are in sorrow or need, sickness or adversity. Remember those who suffer persecution for the faith. Have mercy on those for whom death draws near. Grant them your love and take them into your tender care. Hear us, Lord, as we pray in silence. We remember with thanksgiving those who have loved and served you, who now rest from their labors. Console those who are mourning or living with sadness. Grant us these things, Father, for the sake of Jesus, who died and rose again. Amen. We continue with our next hymn.
Please stand. Blessed Lord, you have given us your holy scriptures for our learning. May we so hear them, read, learn, and take them to heart, that being strengthened and comforted by your holy word, we may cling to the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated for our closing hymn. Once again, a good evening to everyone, and great to worship with you tonight. Join us next weekend as we have one more story from Jesus. We're going to hear from Jesus a story about rejection. Have a good night, and God bless. <laughs>